the Gulf of Mexico is a very unique place geologically. It is home to the largest oil and gas producing region in the continental United States. And it is also one of the most complex continental shelves in the world. So in the Gulf of Mexico, the northern Gulf of Mexico, we have oil and gas bearing shales with a salt sheet underneath them and a layer of sediment on top. And as these different geological forces interact, we get cracks in the oil bearing shale and we get natural seepage coming out of the seafloor. So at thousands of different places in the Gulf of Mexico, oil and gas is naturally seeping very slowly from the seafloor. And in those environments, we have some very special communities of animals. And among the things we've discovered over the years is that there are mussels that get all of their carbon and energy from methane gas. They can live entirely from methane gas. There's tube worms, giant tube worms, meters long, no mouth, no gut, no anus, that get all of their energy from hydrogen sulfide, a gas that's normally toxic, but it's made by bacteria living off oil in the sediments. Now, another thing that came out of our studies in the Gulf of Mexico is that the, uh, the same bacteria that are eating the oil and eating the methane, as a byproduct of that, they're creating the chemical environment where rocks form. And at places where you have oil seeps, you have carbonates form. Now, most of the Gulf of Mexico is mud, soft bottom. So areas where there's rocks are areas where special communities can move in, and corals love rocks. So we've found that, in fact, most of the deep corals in the Gulf of Mexico are associated with oil seeps. We found that from east to west across the Gulf, they're actually quite similar within a depth range. But we see very different communities as we change in depths. The biggest cutoff between the communities occurs between 800 and 1,000 meters. Above 800, we have one type of coral community, predominantly a coral known as Lophelia pertusa, which is a reef-building coral that's famous all over the world for the structure and habitat it provides for fish. But you don't find Lophelia deeper than 800 meters. Some other hard corals cut in, and then deeper than about 1,400 meters, we find all kinds of soft corals, bamboo corals, and black corals um, dominating the communities. Now, similar to that, the seep communities change. Now, they change in a different way because shallow and deep, we still have mussels with the symbionts. We still have two worms, but we have different species. So we get an almost complete species changeover at about 1,000 meters and some additional new species of tube worms and mussels that come in at about 2,000 meters. So similar types of communities, but completely different players and all new species, many of which were unknown to science until we started working at these sites. All of the research we do is at depths greater than it's practical to do with scuba. So when we go to sea, we use large ships and some kind of a deep submergence facility. We'll use either remotely operated vehicles or an ROV or a manned submersible, a submarine. On our next expedition, we'll be using the Jason 2 ROV from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is a finely tuned, remotely operated vehicle built especially for science. Now, in addition to all of the tools they'll bring with them, which will include precision navigation capability, high-definition video cameras, and digital still cameras, we'll take a lot of our own specialized equipment that we've built to work on the seafloor. And this will include devices that we've used to put bands on tube worms so we could measure their age over years, staining devices that we've used to get yearly growth rates in tube worms, specialized collection devices, including one that we nicknamed the Bushmaster, which is a giant hydraulically actuated net that we can put around an intact coral community or tube worm community and collect it for analysis in the lab. Our project in October is a part of a regularly scheduled project, and this project was designed to explore and discover new deep water coral sites in the Gulf of Mexico, characterize those sites, but also conduct experiments that will let us understand how the corals work and why they are where they are. So this will be our main goal, will in fact be to study the deep water coral communities of the Gulf of Mexico. But in light of the recent Deepwater Horizon disaster, we'll be supplementing that work with some additional explorations for sites in closer to the spill 
and we'll be revisiting some of the sites we know very well to see if we can detect any changes over the last year since we were there last. Now, we don't really know what we're going to find when we go back out to visit these communities. We don't know if they will be impacted by the Deepwater Horizon disaster, but they certainly may have. Even though some are adapted to oil, none of them are adapted to dispersant. And if there was a heavy exposure to dispersant in any of the communities, this could have some very serious toxic effects. If, in fact, the dispersed oil forms small globules. This could follow feeding appendages. It could follow respiratory appendages and have a very bad effect on these communities. Similarly, if in areas a deep water plume of oil and dispersant stayed cohesive, if it stayed intact, oxygen in that area could be depleted and all of these animals require oxygen. So certainly we don't know that we'll see an impact but there are a variety of scenarios where we could, and the only way to find out is to go down and take a look.